Historically, it has its roots in China. So one can say that Tong Lao is actually Hong Kong's connection with the motherland, our motherland. And so it's the Chinese heritage we brought over from China all the way to Hong Kong. The Urban Renewal Authority seems to be my biggest competition. They are the ones in getting in the way of um, preserving these neighborhoods. They play a good game where they promise the communities they're there for their interests. My experience has been completely the opposite. To be able to grasp authentic values and heritage is something I want to preserve. It's probably a bit educational for, for different people, for, for the future generation. If you look closely at old photographs, paintings, and even prints of old Hong Kong, you will see the distinct low-rise buildings. Some are two or three stories high, others are more like five or six stories. Shop houses used to lie Hong Kong streets, but few remain today. These historic buildings are called Tang Lao, but why do they look so different from one another in terms of construction materials and architectural style? One reason is that changing Hong Kong government regulations have also altered the appearance of its buildings, including those which have been around since the city was colonized by the British. There are actually four generations of Tang Lao, the buildings you see behind me are the first generation. Its most obvious characteristic is that they are all made of reinforced concrete with balconies over sidewalks. In this episode of Hong Kong Inquirer, we'll take a look at what is the Tang Lao and the opportunities and challenges around them. Fredo John is a heritage conservation specialist and a lecturer at the University of Hong Kong. He took me to see an example of the second generation of Tom Lau, called Blue House. It was built in the 1920s in Wan Chai. He also explained how the Tom Lau style developed over time. Now, where we start seeing changes is around time in the late 19th century, and early 20th century, which we would say the second generation. And that is the introduction of concrete. So whereas the older shop houses in the first generation are pretty much still in the Chinese tradition of um, using brick, plaster, and then timber for construction. And so because of the heat and humidity in Hong Kong, so you can imagine that the first generation of Tong Lao being very basic without a separate space for kitchen and toilets. It's very hot and humid inside, so it was a breeding ground for disease, and that's why we have the outbreak of the bubonic plague. And so to remedy that, Hong Kong came up with its first set regulations for buildings. The use of reinforced concrete or concrete actually prevents that from happening. Also with the second generation of Tang Lao, you start to see in the building elevation, you see projections. So you see balconies. When it comes to the third generation of Tang Lao, Frido told me the building which best amplifies this style would be Loi Sun Chun, located in Mong Kok. It has a wider veranda structure with several pillars, giving pedestrians protection from the elements. But of course, another element which you can see from third generation is the inclusion of Western ornamentation and motifs. That is one of the distinct features about the uh, third generation Tang Lao. And then I think this feature would also be carried on in the fourth generation, which is after the war. In Hong Kong, only structures included on the monuments list are protected from demolition. Other buildings are graded and recognized for their cultural significance. But this does not offer statutory protection. In 2009, the Antiques and Monuments Office identified 87 pre-war shop houses among 1,444 buildings, said to have heritage value, but only the Loi Sun Chun was declared a monument and thus given protection from demolition. That's why you may notice more and more old buildings disappearing in the city. However, there are still some private owners trying to preserve heritage buildings in their own way. 
Their Coslo operates a property company, leasing renovated townhouse units. He has a passion for old buildings in Hong Kong. I met him at his apartment, which used to be a printing press. They renovated the structure, keeping as many of the old fixtures in place as possible. Newer buildings tend to be all very similar, and you can't differentiate between them. Whereas the older buildings, you know, they have this character that's unique and and typical of the old Hong Kong style, which is you know something you don't find anywhere else. I realize it's you know you can't stop progress, but in my view, the developers are really destroying something special. The new buildings going up will never be able to offer that tradition, that connection to the past. Buying and, and maintaining a older building comes with some challenges. It's not the easiest thing. Firstly, uh, it has to do with you know the common spaces and the the uh, need to upkeep and, and modernize some of the the basic features of the building: the electricity, the plumbing, and the common areas. In addition to the issue with you know getting collective support within the building itself, there's external pressures, and that comes from the government actually, from Hong Kong government. For example, when they are requiring that a huge water tank be installed on the top of one of these five-story buildings,、um, the building really can't support that. The Urban Renewal Authority is never there for the people who live in the community. They're there for the developers. They want everybody to believe that old is bad, new is what you need. You need to go into these shiny new buildings and get out of these old things. We faced a lot of problems during our renovation in terms of electricity, water, in terms of the wood, the carpentry of the cabinet. There, there were quite a lot of problems when you turn an ancient building into a modern cafe, and and it was fun. It was、uh, it was challenging, but it was a fun project. That's Henry Shek, the operator of Dai Wutong, which used to be an 86-year-old Chinese metal shop. Located in one of the second generation of Changlao in Kowloon City, it was renovated four years ago, and now it is a coffee shop. For those who want to retain this city's heritage, this is seen as an innovative attempt to try to preserve Hong Kong's Changlao. The first time I entered the building, it was actually like a museum, and it was as if like time stood still. I saw over a thousand of antiques. Including the glass jars that used to hold Chinese medicine, including the wooden cabinet, there were just so many items that I thought could be preserved. I think a cafe for customers to enjoy the atmosphere over a cup of coffee, that would be the sustainable solution. There are those in government and the private sector looking for sustainable ways to revitalize Hong Kong's heritage. And one of the best things which they did was、um, acknowledging the importance of social value, which are contemporary values. You know, like what is the public perception of that heritage asset? And I think by incorporating that into the heritage conservation framework, it paved the way for projects like the Blue House Cluster to happen. Because in Singapore, you know, what they did was、um, they use heritage conservation to solve wider problems. They use it to create a design institute, an incubator for good design, kind of like what we have in PMQ. But they, the Singaporeans, took it one step further, and so they set up this school where you know young designers could actually go in, get a space to, to produce their design, and then translate designs into products. What they did in addition was that they partnered these design future design talents with business successful examples of upstarts and businesses, so that these more experienced、uh, designers and businessmen can give them insight. Entering these old buildings is a good way to develop an interest in history, and discussion around the preservation of Hong Kong's historic buildings will never stop as long as we can still see them on the streets. What do you think? Please drop a comment below and don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more episodes of Inquirer.